He goes to Edward Snowden at the end of the interview. So wait, you're saying my dicks? The government has access to my dicks? And he's like, oh, yeah, I guess. And then he starts going to the same man on the street interviews. Like, well, they can see your, they can see your dicks. And like, oh, I suddenly don't want the government looking. I, I care about privacy now. Let's definitely talk about the Fed at some point, because I know you you covered that yesterday. I want to hear your opinions on it a little further. So let's see if you get it. If you could read my mind, what am I referencing right there? <laughs> Gordon Lightfoot passing away. Oh, One of the, just oh. a great, great songwriter, singer-songwriter. Yeah. yeah, there we go. I, I, I just had to. I was like, I had to look in there, because it was like <laughs> this week. It's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. good times. Consensus debrief. So I had a I had a ball, right? Mm -hmm. I, I we got there. I found it. I've been to Consensus now twice. I went to the one last year where there was just it was foolish. People were just running around, jumping up to you. Here, look at my here. Read my white paper. Let's do this. Like uh, you know, and I I think I mentioned uh, I said either there are a tremendous amount of wasted resources and they're all wrong. Or something here is going to hit, yeah. you know. And I feel like when I went there this time, I was walking around the floor, taking a look at who spent how much money, and figuring that they probably are farther along and probably more comfortable with what they have working at this time. And so I saw Olive, and I saw Franklin Templeton. That was fascinating. Did you see that they actually created a? And this is in the the midst of this crypto winter, Fidelity and Franklin Templeton both. Um, Franklin Templeton came out with an on-chain money market fund. No now they're, way. Yeah. Now, they're not using crypto tokens right, or currency right. to, to stabilize it, but all of their transactions are actually being done on-chain, so they can keep track of... So explain that. So like, it, what, are they, what are the assets they're buying? Yeah, that's a great question, and yeah. I haven't dug deep enough okay. into it. I'm going to have to reach out to their product manager right. and find out, but uh, it so, was just fascinating yeah. that like, Fidelity Investments, and they, they kind of gave me a little heads up and you know, just take the concept for it. They they had a smaller number of people last year, and then mm -hmm. this year, not only have they doubled in size, but they're still hiring. And thank God they're wow. a private company, right? right? Because if, look, we, we know what happened to Mark Zuckerberg when yeah. he said, that, no, I'm still dumping a bunch of money into the metaverse, right? right? So Fidelity, but everyone knows Fidelity. <laughs> Abby Johnson has been all in on crypto for quite some time. Right. So very excited to see that they were yeah. still involved in it. I, I've spoken to them several times about different um, projects they're working on. I was able to go to their um, their uh, client event, the good one as well as the next one. But uh, and you know met with a lot of institutional guys that were really bright, really knew a lot of stuff. So I was really excited to see that there's adults in the room that are actually doing stuff <laughs> on the technology side yeah. as opposed to specifically just the potential reward. My, like, my litmus <clears throat> test is always how cypherpunk is what's being done in crypto and how enterprise is it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so whenever it was like 2017, 2018, and IBM was running the narrative for the industry in terms of enterprise moving into the blockchain, mm -hmm. nobody even wanted to say the word Bitcoin because mm -hmm. that was like, it was hookers and blow. That's all that meant. Big no, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dark web. Yeah. And so like how how willing to embrace like open open blockchains, public blockchains, or how are they trying to still do this permission ledger business? How is that working? I honestly do not know. I do know that um, what I would love to see, and I just I don't know why I have just such a, a anti establishment when it comes to to title companies but like i just want to see i want to see these these parcels of land i mean we've got colin cad dallas cad all all these companies like, literally all over the country we've got these websites already databases of the different transactions yeah. why can't we put that on chain why do you have to pay three percent out of pocket for title insurance on something that you already own you're just refinancing yeah and the one time that we actually found that there was a problem with title insurance a client of mine was refinancing for like the third or fourth time. Of course, you know, just like now, interest rates going up, they were cutting. They cut 11 times in one year. So, of course, we're refinancing multiple times. Like four or five times in, the title came back that it wasn't clean. And I'm like, well, okay, fine. What happened the other times? You know what? We're going to go ahead. We're going to file a, We're gonna file a claim on the title insurance. Right. Oh, no, that's not what it's for. Ooh. Well, then what's it for? <laughs> so, ever since then, I've been... Please find some way to yeah. get rid of this scam of title insurance. Like wasted assets, wasted money, fat on 
the system that doesn't need to be there takes jobs. And as we know, Web3 as well as AI is, is very deflationary. And if you guys don't understand that, I'm happy to explain it. I get, hear it? I get deflationary, but here, talk about it, you know. You might as well. Yeah, so it's an important concept. The deflationary idea is that right now the Fed raises the interest rates effectively to scare. It, it does tighten. It absolutely tightens. Companies then don't actually borrow uh, as much as they did before. Yeah, right. On the short side, the you know banks, they borrow at short rates and they, they lend at long rates. And so if they're borrowing at a higher rate than they can lend, they're going out of business, which is why – we're gonna re- we're gonna have to reconsider I mean, money in the bank with Frank as a title, right? <laughs> <laughs> Great yeah. title, yeah, right. I like that. So we uh, It'd be the only bank with money in it, yeah, right. <laughs> so so effectively, it's deflationary because if we lose jobs in the computers, the AI actually is able to uh, take over those positions and do those tasks mm-hmm. and those chores, mm-hmm. those everyday chores, yeah. like you know, um, translating Swahili to English, mm-hmm. which may have been a really hard position to fill at one point, but maybe mm-hmm. not so much now, that takes another job away that the Fed didn't in- in- anticipate. And so if there's all these people that aren't working and now they can't get a job and we have, you know, it's deflationary because mm-hmm. people aren't going to be, that money isn't going to be ch- chasing after fewer goods. Right, right now we have more money chasing fewer goods. Soon we'll have less money chasing no goods. And so that's right. deflationary because they have to cut prices. You see what Elon Musk is already doing with the Teslas, right? Yeah. His mm-hmm. margins are razor thin already. So what he's doing now is, you know, the, the lowering of the prices is is deflation. Yeah. So, I'm my biggest concern with what these raises are, and they're painted into a box. I mean, we can only work with what we absolutely know. Right, right now, the Fed knows that raising rates increases unemployment, which is what he's trying to do. But what they don't know is what AI is going to do because that mm-hmm. happened four months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. that you know. It's in the midst of these massive layoffs. It's, I don't understand, like, the, I mean, I I understand what they're saying, but I don't understand why they're not, like, looking at the macro. I mean, like, just last week or two, maybe two weeks ago, like, every day that sa- that week, there was uh, XYZ company lays off 25% yeah. of the workforce. And these were not small companies. We're talking about, like, Lyft, mm-hmm. you know? Like, and you're, and you're still trying to curb Employment numbers. So what do you do as like a worker? You know, these are big numbers of of companies and the employees they lay off. What do you do in the midst of being unemployed and this new tech is emerging and, and, you know, kind of seems like there's an opportunity there versus in the past, if you get laid off in a financial crisis, you're like, well, what do I do now? Yeah, let's unpack that. Well, I mean, actually, I just, I tweeted out my opinion on this yesterday, just just coincidentally. I, my, I think... The idea here is to find uh, a skill that you have that a computer is not going to be able to do in the next 20 years and just get really good at it. In the meantime, you have to utilize AI as a tool. Because but what about, it's, it's not AI that's taking jobs. It's right. people that know how to use AI right. that are right. taking jobs. Right. So to your point, though, shouldn't you, if you do have a skill that is replaceable by AI, why can't you adapt to become the best at using the AI, the AI that will replace that skill that you have? Well, because becoming... you could, but people are people are just generally speaking. I don't want to change; it shouldn't affect me. But yeah, so that that's one thing, right? I shouldn't have to. Yeah. It's going to be a prevailing opinion, which is just human nature, right? But the other thing is, uh, just from a game theory perspective, the, of the people that don't have that opinion, it's still a crowded market, and more of the yeah. skill is being taken up by the AI side. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying don't use AI. I'm saying. Use AI, but also work on what your future proof mm-hmm. skill is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you absolutely have to use AI if you want to be competitive. I mean, back to like the fidelity thing that you found out at Consensus. I think it's very interesting to see these big institutions adopt the technology to do what they traditionally do. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I mean, based off of what you said, I don't know any context outside of it, but it sounds like they're doing the same funds that they would do, just they put it on a blockchain. And mm-hmm. That might not sound like a big deal to anyone, but it is a big deal because it fundamentally changes the way it's structured, the way the data is communicated, the way the transactions occur. Um, And that really excites me because, you know, seeing institutional adoption of this technology is very important for us to advance it and for us to have it on a mass scale. Right. Yeah. But you have to protect it, too. There's so many different payment rail systems. Like what's the difference between Venmo and PayPal and, and Zelle and all these different payment systems? They're all still transferring. Yeah. electronic zeros and ones, right? That's all they're doing. 
but they're doing it across platforms where there are regulations that people are making sure for, you know, know your customer and making sure that it's not on the Silk Road. And, um, and you know, maybe in uh, Africa they use the SWIFT system. And yeah. here in America we use the ACH system and they yeah. have to talk to each other in a regulated and regulated way. Just, and it's expensive to change those. But so, but they, and, it needs to be done. Slow, and it it's needs slow. to be done. So the UN just released a report uh, about seven or eight months ago Ago, uh, that says that na- that this, the Western regime of KYC AML rules mm-hmm. that you're just talking about <clears throat> is 98% ineffective at actually stopping crime. Mm-hmm. Wow. Whereas, wow. And so, and if you look at what money is used for in TradFi versus DeFi per capita, mm-hmm. TradFi is by far and away the most popular way to commit crime. <laughs> Do you, you know? Do you know what that is? Traditional finance, yeah. between and decentralized finance. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was just making sure. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Yeah, no, I, no, no, no. I no, appreciate it. For me it. too. It's like I, I, I'm very big about like when introducing new terms on content. It's sure. very important to clarify what they mean, Absolutely. just in case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but if you do want to speak a little more to uh, decentralized finance, uh, you're probably better at it than I am. I mean, yeah. So uh, it, I'll, I'll do the. Uh, the ten dollar words, and you can do the translation for it. Okay, All right, so, let's do that. So, blockchain. Uh, my one sentence definition of, of Bitcoin and blockchain is: Bitcoin is a reference protocol for blockchain, which is a decentralized internet protocol for the mitigation or elimination of trust between counterparties. Wow. So to, to dumb that down very quickly, it's basically a blockchain is just a decentralized or de- distributed database and a way of sharing information and. Uh, Bitcoin is just the currency that you would use on the blockchain to make transactions. Right. Yeah. So whenever I start that SMU class, yeah, that's, that's the sentence uh, I start with. Yeah. And then like sure two hours explaining lost. what that sentence is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, essentially, DeFi is is exactly what you said, and it's uh, the the buzzword everyone likes to use now, especially with the CBDC talks going yeah. around, is programmable money. Mm. Meaning you can you can give instructions to your money, and whether or not a human is there to implement those things, the the thing will happen. Mm-hmm. And the underlying tech behind that is the smart contracts, right? right. Smart contracts and blockchain. Yeah. Mm. The ten dollar word for that uh, the, the, t- the is uh, Turing complete blockchains, versus what non-Turing, Bitcoin yeah. is is a non Turing complete blockchain. So okay, so what? Wait, break that down. This Turing, I've never heard of that. Alan Turing. So yeah, it's it's named after Alan Turing, okay. the guy who broke the Enigma code during World War II mm, with his team at right, Bunchy Park. Right. And what Turing Complete means is essentially a uh, a threshold of the number of types of instructions a computerized system can understand. Got it. And Bitcoin falls below that threshold. Ethereum and EVM compatible machines right. throw above that threshold. Got yeah. It. And that's why you could do so much with. Ethereum right. and other cryptocurrencies. Very technically speaking, you can do some types of smart contracts on Bitcoin, like ordinals right, that you've talked right, about. Right. But that's not necessarily at the level of programmability it's that you different. see on Ethereum. The way the data is inscribed, from my understanding, is completely different. Yeah. It's UTXOs versus yeah. standard addresses. Okay, know? let's stop there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually yeah, kind we're of funny. deep into the crypto side. There was a there was a guy. I went to the All In Summit, the first one, uh, and it was it was a lot of fun. But there was just there were so many just hilarious people there from all segments of the world. And one guy was so secretive about his tech. He was like, "Yeah, I'm working on this smart contract." He goes, "I shouldn't." You know, couple of cups in so so i shouldn't show you this but look at this and this is just graphic of like everything that they're working on and he's like don't don't tell anyone about it i'm thinking to myself what am i going to tell him (laughs) i barely understand it what am i going to say that's a pretty circle (laughs) yeah this stuff is is definitely like super complicated and i Mm -hmm. still think we're you know in that era of like how you mentioned with web one like we're still mm-hmm. in a place where it's all being figured out right now and it's all being developed right now and even like for me you know my job is to educate people and simplify it as much as possible and i find that to be challenging you know even when i have conversations with more sophisticated people there's certain you know components and individual aspects of each uh part of crypto blockchain web3 etc etc et cetera, mm-hmm. that you know it's hard it's hard and you introduce one term a ledger People don't even know what a ledger is besides Web3, like in general. People don't even know what that word means. So I think, you know, with where we're at with the space, it's just important to 
uh, educate and simplify it as much as possible. And that's why when a company like Fidelity does what they traditionally do, but implement some sort of blockchain aspect to it, it's exciting because it seamlessly onboards so many people. It provides an experience that's easy that mm -hmm. people want to use and it's attractive, right? Like it's something they already know and they're not even thinking about the blockchain side. If the UX and the UI is done correctly, mm -hmm. the people who are going to be making these investments with Fidelity aren't even going to consider the blockchain because it's going to be so in the background mm -hmm. that it's so seamless and easy for them to use. And once we get to a point where everything is like that, then we'll have real mass adoption for all this stuff. Mm. I mean, I think that's I think that's what we saw, like why the downfall of NFTs occurred like, yeah, in terms of art, art NFTs is because, mm -hmm. first of all, you got to spend 10 minutes explaining what NFT means. Yeah. Uh, and and, and most it's people not a picture of a monkey. Ex <laughs> that's just exactly what I was about to say. It's not just monkeys and pictures and stuff like that. It's it's, it's a whole other technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the they this year I've noticed one of the things out of consensus and even uh, from NFT NYC mm -hmm. last month. You were there? No, I spoke there. Oh, you did? Yeah. Cool. I, I just there. I just read I love the it there. online stuff. Well, it's, it's, they it was call a little sh not that good this year. Where yeah. was it? It was in New York. New York. Yeah. I mean, the Jarvis Center. Okay. Yeah. I was there last Javits Center? Yeah, Javits Center. Center. Sorry. Yeah, 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 it's all right. Not a New Yorker, you know? It's all good. It's all good. The Javits Center is great for things like, you know, things that you can't afford, like the boat show and the car show, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. the car show is actually happening that same time. I'm parking my car. I thought this crackhead, you know, everyone in New York is screaming and yelling at some point. I thought this crackhead was <laughs> yelling at me. So he's yelling at me. Nice guy, actually. At the end of the day, I found out he just wanted to give me a ticket to the auto show. So after I finished my first day at NFT NYC, I just walked over to the auto show. It was massive. Yes, but uh, yeah, yeah, it was funny. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, no, I'm trying to give you a free ticket. Yeah, no, I was like parking. I'm like, my guy, like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm tr I'm on the phone trying to figure out, like, if I can park here or not. Because, you know, the New York parking situation. Yeah, yeah. Worse yeah. than anything I've ever experienced. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this guy's yelling at me at the same time. And I thought, you know, typical New York. I gave a, you know, strong attitude back to him. But it, the guy was actually very nice. He just wanted to give me a free ticket. Yeah. I yeah. felt really bad after. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. But you were saying something about New York and consensus and the uh, projects there. Well, I, I was just saying, like, uh, you know, it. The, the the new term that they're trying to push for that segment of NFTs. Let was, me guess, digital assets. Uh, no, I think that's more on the finance side. Crypto okay. art. Crypto art. Right, which is just you know, the same thing as art. Yeah. Yeah. Did you go to the gallery? Did you see that part in the gallery where they had uh, across the street? Right, right across the street. I, I yeah. didn't see it. I saw the building. Yeah, I went in and there were a uh, few artists. There was like one asset manager, I think, and the one that I saw anyway. And yeah. then there was a uh, several artists on stage, and they were talking about how they have more control over their art. Yeah, and they, you know, and, and I'm still not quite sure that I understand exactly um, how that benefits, uh, like the art. Yeah, how that benefits. Like if you're a musician and you have your music you own your music mm -hmm. on the blockchain other than people buying it like but also like are the radio stations going to play it like yeah how does this right so it's it's all about two things when it comes to art mm -hmm. provenance mm -hmm. and commit and uh, residuals right and i get provenance on on traditional art yeah for sure yeah well so but there's a lot of art out there that I bought in garage sales that aren't really worth a whole heck of a lot, too. Mm -hmm, so there's sure. going to be a lot of NFTs out there that. Mm -hmm. Well, so here's the thing, right? If if the there, you got two you got two things at play, right? Mm -hmm. The there has never been a since the birth of the internet a way to, in a um, decentralized way, to enforce a move not copy copyright scheme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Napster broke sure. broke the internet, broke mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. When it said you can copy whatever you want, actually that had been broken years before when the file system was invented. But mm -hmm. Napster was the one that exploited it. Yeah. But NFTs offer potentially a way to have a move not copy operation, mm -hmm. right? Especially when it comes to a uh, a large block file asset, mm -hmm. like you with with like a lot of the artwork that you see on NFTs. Uh, you can always just download, you can copy paste it or whatever, mm -hmm. but you still, there's a, you can, there's certain functions within NFTs that will allow you to embed a larger file that you only have access to if you, if you own, own the own NFT. It. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are several marketplaces for music that have been trying to develop, you know, a following and part of it is hindered by the UX issues of, mm -hmm. of blockchain of uh, basically a Spotify or a uh, iTunes 
where the music is in an NFT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you actually do have enforced move, not copy. Mm -hmm. So you can purchase something and you actually own a unique, unique version of that that could be, you know, signed and numbered and mm -hmm. not transferable yeah. or transferable depending upon the wishes of the artist. Well, well, I think like a big thing with the art thing is that before you even get into like the monetization and how it helps artists, I think like when it all happened like a year in 2021 and the bull run happened, I think it just gave artists, it put artists back on the map, right? Like artists are kind of, you know, anyone who wants to be an artist, they say, oh, it's not a real career or this or that. And I think when the NFT run happened at first, it gave a lot of attention to that. And then it opened that door of, okay, now we own it in a different way. Now what, you know, what Mark was saying with the copying and the way you move the files is it's fundamentally different. And eventually once it all uh, is adopted by the masses, right, that's going to be the new normal. That's going to be uh, the way we just interact with art or music or videos. Mm -hmm. It's all going to be NFTs. Now, what does that look like at the end of the day? And what are the true benefits? Where is their true utility? Um, I think that's still being figured out now. But I do think that it has fundamentally changed the way uh, artists have opportunities, the way they can control their rights and, and their, their actual assets. Because these are assets. They're intangible, yes. But to an artist who's spending all their time making this art piece or this music, that's real to them. And if even if it's digital, it's still very real. And now it allows them to control it and to have um, ownership and other monetization opportunities that didn't exist before. Well, it's, it's also a, uh, a way to build and uh, corral your community yeah, without sure. having to rely on a centralized platform. It just opened a new door that didn't exist before, you know? Right. Can I can I walk this back for a minute? Sure. Please. So <clears throat> I'm a big fan of, you know, making efficiencies and, and making money, right? You know, sure. I'm not uh, naive enough to think that, uh, that the world doesn't revolve around fear and greed, yeah. right? Uh, my concern here has to do with, again, I understand and perhaps it's the cutting edge and people's feelings are the reason that they want to do art and they want to own it and they want to ship it and they want to do that. I like the use cases instead of that part of it. Mm -hmm. More like if you're a, a rock band and um, I used to be the generation where we'd wake up super early and go camp in front of Sears for two days so we'd Just go see Motley Crue, yeah. right? And then we'd get like four tickets instead of two and then I'd sell two mm -hmm. to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, but the band never got any money from that, right? Yeah. They didn't get the step up in basis. And right. so now I know that I think an NFT of tickets is actually fascinating, right? Because every time that gets transferred from one wall to another, they can get a cut. Yeah. Same thing with- Well, the royalties is a yeah. big thing for yeah. sure. Yeah, so I get that. But quite frankly, and let's be clear, I'm, I go to the, the symphony orchestra. I love, I'm going to see Carmina, uh, Carmina Burana coming up here soon. I love the arts. Yeah. But I don't own a lot of art. And I think that a lot of people that are worried about the provenance, they're going to figure that part of it out too. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't see that everybody that is very capable at creating art online is going to be successful at it. For sure, right? right? And that doesn't mean so, just because this technology enables that doesn't right, mean they're going right. to be right. Yeah, you could be the first person that did it and sell your NFT for, <clears throat> you know, uh, of a, of the board apes for you know more yeah. than you ever expected, yeah. or take pictures of a frog in three different settings and then sell that as an NFT. But, but here's right. here's it's what working. It, here's where where the case studies do value? support. Yeah. Uh, do the case studies do support that it is bringing more freedom to artists mm -hmm. uh and i can point to uh artists like eclectic method who's like a remix artist or right. uh another one uh by the name of shepherd ferry who you may know more uh famously as the guy that did the hope poster for obama and the obey and the oh, andre okay. the giant has a posse sure sure, yeah. sure yeah artists like this uh specifically not in general but specifically those two made most of their money doing commissions based on the famousness of previous artwork they've done. Mm. Right. Since the advent of the NFT revolution, these one-of-one one artists yep. are able to sell directly to fans. And mm -hmm. yes, some of them still do some commissions, but they don't have to rely on commissions to eat. They can right. directly now. connect. Now. It opened those. that new door. Yeah. Now. Now keep in mind, what we're talking about is tightening monetary policy and what happens when people are worried about feeding themselves and their family. They stop spending money on things that are non-essential, right? Sure. And and granted, we have had 
an explosion in in M1, right? I mean, they're they, and they had to because mm-hmm. of COVID. There's a ton of money out there, and this goes back to that question you were having before. Over 20 years ago, people were used to um, the markets fluctuating and interest rates being all over the place. You know, somewhere in the three to five percent, munis at six percent. Uh, you know, there was there was we didn't have 30 percent a year forever like right. we've had lately and that's because we've had so much monetary policy and now they're pulling that out that liquidity is coming out of the system and the problem is for the past 20 years no one has seen that market and so it's reverting again to the mean and you're going to start seeing a lot more struggle and with that struggle you're going to have a lot of people that actually are in this industry these industries that actually feel entitled that why isn't anyone buying my art well, because yeah. there's no art, no one's buying art. But okay, so think about, think back to more than 20 years ago in the music industry, who made all the money? Yeah, the, the labels. labels. The labels. Sure. Right. Yeah. Those labels don't exist anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there is a whole lot more money floating around that can go directly to artists mm-hmm. uh, if they're able to directly interface with these fans. And that's what blockchain yeah. and that's what uh, yeah, a lot of these like democratizing tools in social media allow them to do Mm -hmm. and to your point though like that entitlement i mean that's just such a flaw like that's as an individual if you are at a point where you're so entitled that you're like why are people not buying my art that's just ignorance i mean the world works a certain way whether you like it or not and you know as i said i'm a huge fan of like you know anything that you, you got to get them cook, hooked on the candy, right? Like yeah. if, if I'm watching something on Netflix that they actually created or they have these different windows, let's say, you know, you're moving it from Netflix over to yeah. Amazon and so on and so forth. And they, depending on who it is that actually owns the rights to that title mm-hmm. at that moment, mm-hmm. they get paid. Now, how do they get paid, right? It's my understanding that you have to watch it for a specific amount, amount of, time of time before they get yeah. any part of it. But then when do you get paid out? Maybe a month Months or two months later. later. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? We have this technology that allows you to say, "We watched it right now. Pay me." Yeah. Right. That and, is and, fascinating. And micropayments. Like. Yeah. 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 Like every every view, theoretically, if it's been you know more than thirty seconds, you can get that payment. You know. Yeah. So l- let's go down this rabbit hole because I I saw in one of my newsletters yesterday they were talking about like how you can get a uh, cryptocurrency for opening your email and cryptocurrency for watching this ad and all this stuff. How do you guys think like how will that look and how will it work and where is their value in that? Because it's like Okay, does that mean every ad I watch on YouTube, I'm going to get a YouTube coin? Great, that's fine. But, like, it's like you can't just create a YouTube coin, just have a YouTube coin. Like, where is the true utility in that? Why would I as a consumer and I as a business want to, you know, incentivize people to watch my ads by earning my poo coin? (laughs) I'm just curious because, like, you know. Yeah, no, so it really depends – on a lot of factors, uh, I don't. I don't think most things need to be tokenized. Uh, Seems like everything is being but tokenized. Some well, so you've, you've got two. You've got two things that that are going to prohibit things from being tokenized. So NFTs were originally designed as an enterprise product. Uh, Cody Marks Bailey, a, for, uh, a Dallasite, is mm-hmm. one of the guys that authored the ERC seven twenty one specification. Wow. He was the founder, one of the founders of the NTBA, the predecessor organization mm-hmm. for T, uh, TBC. Um, and so, uh, Texas blockchain council. That's right. Yeah. In, in, in the building where we filmed this. So, um, (laughs) they, uh, but when he, when it was created, like the thought was, this is going to be great for supply chain and IBM built all their marketing, all their blockchain marketing from 2016 to 2019 around this idea that all supply chain was going to be on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Um, what everybody quickly realized is that the throughput on the EVM is not uh, enough to support even a small sized corporation's supply chain needs without transaction fees becoming out of control. So, um, but also, is it profitable for them to do that? Well, it would be profitable if the transaction fees were minuscule. Like, so how much does it cost to move an NFT? I don't know if you've bought any NFTs, like, but if you like, it costs, of course, like. 30, 40 bucks sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's 20 bucks. Sometimes it's 10 bucks. All right. So think about if you're Walmart or any you're store, and every time a can of peas moves from this shelf to that shelf, you've got to update the public ledger. Mm-hmm. You can't do that if it costs you 20 bucks to but move that NFT. But what if your NFTs. blockchain Walmart makes? So I know IBM made a blockchain Hyper-Ledger. for Walmart. Yeah, but it's awful. Okay. So it's not public. 
Well, okay, that's my point, though. Yeah. If Walmart has their own private blockchain just for this exact reason about, you know, they move this can to this shelf, couldn't they just program it in a way where there is no transaction fee? So this is why I was asking how cypherpunk was it at Consensus? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because this is, I mean, IBM hired me to be a futurist back when this was going on, and I would go into every conference and make myself very unpopular by saying, <laughs> why, make, why make a private blockchain a private database, a SQL database is going to be so much more efficient and because there's no decentralization in a private blockchain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's all run on the same gridiron, all your nodes are on the same gridiron, which is going to be in an IBM data warehouse somewhere, then it's not decentralized. So is is there still benefit to it though by using blockchain technology versus the traditional data storing technology that Walmart now uses? If, if it's not decentralized, if, there is no benefit. So I'm if a, there, it, whoa, hold on. That's are you sure? Yes. There's no benefit if it's not decentralized in any way, shape, or form. It's like, actually it's actually worse because okay. it's slower. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. That's interesting. That's why I say it's not worth it to tokenize some things. Yeah. Or put some things on the blockchain. Until we figure out scaling on EVMs. I was going to say, do you think that will change as this technology scales oh, and gets better? Absolutely. I mean, the best minds in the world are working on it, but we're not there yet. So, so eventually, though, even though it's private, Walmart will have a more efficient uh, blockchain than their current ways of storing data. Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. so let me ask you, in my opinion, yes. A question. You hear about companies putting their data in a sandbox, right? Like you've mm -hmm. got Walmart who buys certain things based on certain criteria that they have in-house yeah. knowledge and information about. How do you see their moat, their wide and deep moat of what they know and their IP, how do they protect that while still being decentralized? Mm. So I don't think a... Uh, a blockchain is the answer for everything. Remember that that very dense sentence that we we started with, and then we're going to unpack. Like, so a blockchain is a decentralized protocol for the exchange of value. It only makes sense when trust is an exploitation vector that can bring down a system. Mm -hmm. If trust is not an exploitation vector that can bring down a system, don't use a blockchain. What about speed? So, well, I mean, that's that's another factor that helps you decide. But the first question should be: Are two potentially adversarial counterparties going to be interacting mm. because the whole purpose of a blockchain what Satoshi Nakamoto wrote the Bitcoin white paper was to solve the what's called the Byzantine generals problem it's a big computer science problem where you're trying to coordinate a bunch of adversarial parties towards a common goal mm -hmm. this is a computer science problem that uh, that is applicable to rocket uh, telemetry it's applicable to aero aeronautics when you're coordinating jet engines that don't mm -hmm. have a computerized control system. Yeah, sorry for my ignorance, but where does that where is that adversary? Because it doesn't sound like it's between people. Well, but if you're talking about Walmart and all of their suppliers, suppliers. and all of, these are potentially adversarial because they have competing interests. Yeah, but one they're buying from each other and selling to each other. Mm -hmm. And there's all these different mm -hmm. exploitation vectors in the supply chain. That That's why you want to have a blockchain in the first place. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you think? So, but if yeah, you're talking no, about I'm, internal to Walmart, though, yeah. a blockchain is not the right answer. Yeah. It That's needs to be private. super interesting. I really like this. This is a very good conversation. So my thoughts, and I'm a macro guy, and I'm not as into the actual technology as you guys are. So for me, thinking about it, it's like if you have, if you know that you're a pharma company, right, and yeah. you, you know that you need to sell those blue pills, and they mm -hmm. need to get from point A to point B mm -hmm. or point E, and then they're going to stop everywhere along they're yeah. gonna have different right. hops, right? And it could fall off the truck at any one of them, <laughs> right? That's when you know every time it's scanned in, you know exactly where it is. So right. that would protect them from like the FDA saying, well, where's this shipment? Right. Or, hey, these are bad. How do you track that very efficiently? So that would be something that I imagine Pfizer would want internally, right. as but well as somebody like the FDA being but able that's to just, track where that's their just stuff basic is supply too. chain, though, right? Right, right, sure. It doesn't necessarily chain. need to be a blockchain. Mm -hmm. but unless you're dealing with people who are, like I said, not all on the same team. Mm -hmm. Like people with competing interests that all have some stake in the system, that's when you want to think about blockchain, perhaps. Perhaps. Right. Well, you do because like those pharma companies have to deal with pharmacy benefit management companies as well as, as which well is as internal, the, still, which is internal because, yeah, to some degree. Yeah. The PBMs yeah, as well sense. as the as well as the benefit consultants as well as the actual plan sponsor, the person who actually pays the bill yeah. every year. Right. 
that has no idea what their data is. They, yeah. they they own it, but they can't read it. So perfect. So then, so we've answered the first question. Yes, a blockchain may be appropriate. Then the second question is the one you brought up, which is, mm -hmm. what about the cost? Yeah. Can is the cost of moving things around on this blockchain less than the cost of of the stop loss we're trying to prevent, mm -hmm. like the the adversarial mm -hmm. loss that would have occurred? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that is also yes, then let's absolutely implement this on the best blockchain for this purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The most decentralized one that we can afford, because the right. more decentralized it is, the more secure it is. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting, like talking about all this stuff, because I think a lot of the ideas in Web3 and in blockchain are uh, very theoretical and are not practical at this current stage. I think, you know, you go to conventions and Consensus did a really good job at filtering very high value companies. But I think a lot of the companies in the space and a lot of the solutions these companies are offering are very, very theoretical versus practical uh, to the point about you going to these conferences and being unpopular. I mean, I go and I see this and I'm like, OK, this is way less efficient than what we currently have. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yes, the blockchain is nice and, and it's going to be there eventually. But like right now, there are a lot of things that are not working and that people are talking about and they're talking about decentralization, which I'm making a video about. But at the end of the day, people don't care about decentralization. They don't they they do. They do. That's a big hot take. I know they do. But at the end of the day, a normal person they don't care about that word. Yes, they care about what decentralization brings to them. They care about how when they use their social media app that it's decentralized and they don't have to think about it, right. but they know they can control their data. They don't want Mark Zuckerberg telling them what they can and can't say on Facebook, exactly. but they don't think about, well, maybe if there's a decentralized social network, right. Mark Zuckerberg wouldn't tell right. me what I could and couldn't say, right. you know? Yeah. Feelings. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Right, so you're you're absolutely right though. They don't care about decentralization. Mm -hmm. It's like people don't care about privacy either. Right. They they care, do. they care about private. So you ever see the John Oliver thing where he actually gets people to care about privacy? No. Oh, it's a great thing. It's where he basically he's interviewing uh, Edward Snowden, and Edward Snowden <laughs> love is, that guy. He's talking about all the things that the government has access to, and then he go, and then he does like a series of man on the street interviews where he's trying to uh, like get people to care about this stuff, and then. He goes to Edward Snowden at the end of the interview. So wait, you're saying my dick pics? The government has access to my dick pics? And he's like, oh, yeah, I guess. And then he starts going to the same man on the street interviews. Well, they can see your they can see your dick pics. And like, oh, I suddenly don't want the government looking. I, I care about privacy now. Do you really think that you're important enough for the government to care about individually? Yeah. I mean, if you are, then you probably should get caught. Like, <laughs> you probably shouldn't be taking dick pics in the first but, place. <laughs> but I'm not really worried all that much about it. I'm pretty sure they could find plenty about every one of us yeah. in one but way that, or another. But that's right? the yeah, point yeah. at which people care about privacy is when it comes to the genitalia. Uh, <laughs> but that's just uh, the, the average American person, I guess. I well, don't know. I guess those guys. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know how we got here. <laughs> Privacy. People Privacy. care about privacy. Yeah. I mean, look, if you if like you, de uh, decentralization, it, that's what yes. you're talking. Yeah. Yes. If you look at if you look at the privacy concern thing, I think you you need to take the good and the bad. You know, mm -hmm. if, if I if you you know if I send in my blood test to find out 23andMe and it comes up with information saying that you're at risk of this really weird form of cancer unless you know you look at this. These are some different things. It's like, who doesn't want to live longer? Who doesn't yeah. want to live forever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you want to, you want to market things towards. Um, you've got acute scoliosis, blah 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 blah. You might consider doing something like this, right? So, I don't mind them serving me ads like that. So, do you think that right? blockchain provides a, a solution or some sort of better, more efficient way of doing this, where the data that users do want, you know, to actually be exposed can be exposed, and they can control that better? Versus what we currently have where it's like, you know, you basically click a checkbox and they have all your information. Well, Do you think that will change with the blockchain? I think Web3, which is enabled by blockchain and other yeah. decentralized technologies, yeah. offers us an escape hatch to surveillance capitalism. Okay. Which is like the whole hmm. ad monetized world that we live in. And you don't think that these companies who run that would adapt to, you know, make blockchain more... It, oh, more. yeah, they're, absolutely. They're in a position to subvert that. And they, I mean, that was what Libra was an attempt to do. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's, this is what I always said with, uh, what, even how I, wrongheaded I thought IBM's approach to blockchain was, mm -hmm. I was, I was happy that it was going on because crypto and blockchain is like a poison pill mm -hmm. uh, to 
people that are in business because they do a little bit of it and they see a little bit of success. And what does every corporation do once they see some new se- sector with a little bit of success? They go, well, if a little bit's great, a lot's well, going to be amazing. Yeah. And they just double down on stuff and yeah. without realizing they're disrupting their own business so and IBM changing the paradigm. So IBM did this with um, the biggest like trade company. It's called like Maersk. It's from Denmark. Maersk. Yeah, I know them. Maersk, yeah. And um, so Simon Mack actually put me on to this. But they that was the biggest supply chain like case study project that any company, anyone did. Every Ivy League like did studies on it. And basically it failed. Um, the blockchain component of it was extremely successful. Like very, it went very well. They were able to make the supply chain much more efficient. But the reason it failed is because IBM and Maersk were unable to make any money from it. The business side of it did not work. So, where is the bridge where oh, it see, does that's, work? That, that's just because they were short-sighted. They were using private uh, distributed ledger technology. If it had been on public distributed ledger technology, you know, an EVM. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're able to create a derivatives market off of live blockchain data. So why would they be incentivized to make it public though when all that information is so private and it is so specific to the core business models of those two companies? Uh, Because, um, I mean, so like, I'm not a derivatives expert, but commodities Um, trading is what- You could probably speak on this. I mean, uh, yeah, you probably could, Uh, but commodities trading smooths out supply chain issues. Yeah. Uh, because people are able to, you know, make fu- make futures bets. Yeah, like if you if you know the price is going to change between now and then, and you're an air, of, of fuel, and you're an airline, you're going to make speculative bets on the price of fuel to hedge uh, against yeah. what's going on now, so that you don't go out of business when the price fluctuates too mm. deeply. That's part of what those markets are built mm-hmm. for. My big question is how much of that also had to do with labor. Right, mm. because if you make something super efficient, like I know that there are ports throughout the world that are much more efficient than our ports in LA. I mean, that was made very clear during mm. the pandemic. You've yeah. got, I think it's Nigeria that has this like 24 7 running, almost automated port that's like supposed amazing. to be amazing. What do you think those union workers at uh, Elizabeth the Seaport would do if you told them that they're not going to have a job tomorrow? And uh, how many jobs know. would be out too? Yeah. Right, Maersk, big, big. You know, the biggest, I believe, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's there's probably some consideration there as well. Yeah, right? that's a good point. Um, so maybe the technology was perfectly fine, and they'll find a way to integrate it slowly over time. Yeah. Or you know, just like what you guys were talking about before, you know, Zuck finally said, "Hey, you know what? We're firing a bunch of people. Everyone got happy, and then everyone else used it as an opportunity. It was like we didn't do it. They told us to do it, so we're firing people too. Google, yeah. everyone, all these yeah. mm-hmm. big companies that have all this fat." Yep. that are trimming that fat. Now they have an opportunity to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the thing. Uh, and this is, uh, I've got a buddy uh, that's in the talent and uh, recruiting space. And mm-hmm. he said that what was going on, how these companies got so fat is they were uh, offensively hiring talent. They were soaking up all the talent in given sectors so that their competition couldn't have it. Mm. And so they had all these people that were doing projects. When was that? Were, that? It's been like the last 10 years. Hmm. Yeah. And today, I don't know if you heard about it today, but the IBM basically took a hiring freeze and they said, we are we are putting a hiring freeze on everybody that it may be, that AI may affect. But it's just like every day another big company. It's right. not, it's not even, it's, yeah. it's like the new normal, you know? And I think, I think, look, unless you're affected by it directly, which many, many people are, right? I don't want to uh, discredit that. It, it's a horrible thing. But at the same time, like, that's what it is, right? Like yeah. you got to adapt and that's the name of the game. You know, I have conversations with other people about this that are actually in the studio. Um, but the world works in a certain way and yeah. you could think about your euphoric world. But the reality is, is you're going to get fired. And if you don't adapt, you don't figure out why you got fired, how you can get rehired and bring more value to the table than before. You're going to be a sucker of the game, right? And and with yeah. any new technology. That, that comes back to what game are you playing, right? You have to look at the game that you're playing. Depends not, what country not, you're in, not too. The, not the game you're playing right now, but what's the real big game, yeah. right? Because ultimately, uh, one, one of the things that I, I kind of fell onto, and now it's really, it's just been driving around in my head, and it, it comes down to the work week that we have right now. Yeah. Like I was talking to um, Sohil earlier mm-hmm. about... You know, the 40 hour work week mm-hmm. used to be something that was actually, it was cutting people hours, right? They were working 120 hours. Right? Yeah. It was like children, there was everything. Yeah. And then they said, okay, we need more butts in the seats. And so we yeah. need to make it 40 hours. And then if you need more shifts, then you hire more people. So right. there's three shifts. 
do you really need 40 hours to do your job every day? No. Or are you sitting around no. playing your videos, no. looking at cat videos? Yeah. Look so at what happened with Twitter. With technology mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. with AI, it's going to be even more efficient. Maybe the number goes down. Like our it's we not a bad more, thing. We have comp like I'm managing money. I'm a discretionary asset manager. At 1:30 Central Time, 2:30 Eastern, and I'm here with you guys. Right. Yeah. Because I have access. To everything, to the portfolio right here, everywhere, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So That's maybe a great point. Maybe the change now is that we remove this hourly thing and we do it based on production. Maybe we do it based on something else. But so the whole it's system. obvious that you know there's a lot of discord in our society. I think we'll all agree with that. No, for and sure. And I think yeah. a lot of this discord is because we're not challenged as we used to be. Right, we, we, we have more time to complain yeah. about the stuff that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, 100 years ago, we'd be out in that field making our own food yeah. or doing something. And technology helped us. Yeah. So I maybe we just have to, we have to redefine productivity. And this really brings like us that. to the question that I don't know, which is how do you put value on a worker's ability, life, human life in general? As it gets more well, and more easy, right? It's like 4% of the world. I mean, to get 4% of the population makes all of our food now. It used to be 90%. Yeah. I mean, to get to get a little bit uh, political, I mean, we're headed towards a post scarcity society. I mean, that's where this is all going. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is Star Trek. Yeah. Like, so, like, we're, we're probably. You solved that last election. We'll figure it can out. Can you define what that means? Post scarcity meaning there is no, there's no, uh, there's abundance. Yeah. Like, the, the, the only uh, scarcity or the things that make it difficult to acquire goods, services, and food, clothing, and shelter are mostly artificial. Yeah. That's what we were talking about yesterday, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know. So those are, I think those are the bigger things. And what's really interesting is there's a, a, a friend of mine, I read an article or a, a paper, almost like a final farewell in a, a risk management magazine. And he talked about, you know, what we need to do as risk managers of big companies is to invest and, and focus on the things that are actually going to you know, work on that productivity issue mm -hmm. and do it in, in a way that is actually friendly to the environment. So we'll see. I, I just hope that everyone takes that into consideration that like you know maybe we're looking at the wrong questions and yeah. trying to solve the wrong questions, yeah. which really revolve around if we get to that post-scarcity environment, we're going to have even more opportunity to hate each other. Mm -hmm. so, so here's... <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, but That's there's true. also That's a lot true. of realm for hope, in my opinion. Sure. Yeah. So, like, I, I we I, survived so far. Wow, I, I, I don't feel that way. So please, oh yeah, change my mind. Okay, so, I mean, I, I, one of the big projects that I worked on for the last 15 months is in the social impact DAO space, mm -hmm. which is a very specific uh, sector of DAOs that tries to, as, without going into all the the nitty gritty details, uh, attack. Uh, what would be public funded problems. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, usually the trajectory, and I wrote a big report about this. If you go Google search the diseconomy of memes, you'll find a report that I did with Rutgers <laughs> about this topic that go, it's like 30 page report. Wait, but, uh, attack public funded problems or attack problems that are right now being addressed publicly? It, it would attack problems that would normally be like yeah, a government got funded yes, solution. Gotcha. Uh, but coming from private funding. Okay. Um, and the, the, the trajectory of this solution would be uh, some crisis event hits or some uh, lightning bolt moment happens where it brings attention to an issue. A crowdfund is put together, an endowment is created, and then the problem is slowly solved over time from the proceeds of the endowment. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that paints a picture of, of about uh, close to three quarters of a billion dollars that was raised for wow. specific public funded type problems. Like I just, so like this, this would include groups like uh, Hong Kong Coddle, which was a, that uh, uh, Ottawa trucker sit-in sure, protest yeah, about the sure, mass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Assange Dow, which raised $40 million for the for public Julian, defense of yeah. Julian Assange. Uh, Free Ross Dow, which raised $12 million to help uh, get Ross Ulbricht out of prison, double life sentence plus 40 years for making a website. Uh, also uh, established a eight million dollar fund and then an additional hundred million dollars of donations that went to Ukraine Dow and the Ukrainian government to establish the civilian resistance network mm -hmm. against the Russian invasion. Mm -hmm. We're talking all this happened over the course of about three or four months. Yeah, and they all follow the same trajectory, and it's created a model for uh, essentially capital markets 
who are operating at peak efficiency to stop funding, uh, you know, basically people at the top making money and start pub funding public good. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you may have covered this or this may have already been answered at some point, but I haven't ever heard it and I have to go because I'm cutting time short at some point. But I do have a question regarding uh, public funding of things like so it's pretty famous that there was that copy of the Constitution and it they like, were the ones that kicked off this trend so, Constitution so Dow the Constitution Dow I lost that. they, they did. lost what happened to all that money like how do you efficiently get that money back to people oh, what that's the beauty of it right so it's all public so juice box was the specific smart contract constellation they used to raise that money mm -hmm. um, at the end of the auction you uh, or at the end of the auction when it failed, you had the option to leave your money in the Dow and participate in the group governance of that money and change the mission, or press a different button and get all your money back, including the gas fees. Yes, well, not including gas fees, but I mean, how much was that? I mean, gas fees are going to be like two bucks a transaction. Yeah, but the total sum of all the people who who contributed probably was very big. Yeah, you know, it would be a lot of gas in aggregate, but I mean, as long as you contributed more than two dollars, you're getting all your money back. You know, within a margin. Yeah. And it's not like the DAO is getting those transaction fees, right? Yeah, like, he did. Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum. The miners. blockchain. The blockchain yeah. does. Like, which is different from, like, let's say Wells Fargo. If you're yeah. sending all your money to Wells Fargo, paying them a transaction fee, at the end of the day, if they're sending that money back, they're keeping that transaction fee. Mm -hmm. That's the difference with the blockchain. Is there's no middleman per se. I know that's a buzz phrase, but. It's true. Well, it's it's true. Fundamentally, the, technically, the blockchain itself is is, is the middleman. Middle Correct. Right? But, yeah. And as long as those fees keep, keep coming in and get more efficient, right? I well, that's the whole thing, right? Is now we're trying to make it so it's super super low, where it's almost right. not even uh, noticeable or right. doesn't have any influence mm -hmm. on the any other super hot topics we want to talk about. I, I, I think I, we can wrap. This yeah. is a good wrapping spot. Cool. Yeah. cool. So I think we've solved all the world's problems today. So we can call it a call it a wrap, and maybe come back and solve whatever comes up next week or a couple weeks later, and you know just give package it. That's it. Good. Super Sounds heroes. good. All right. Well, thanks for sticking with us. This <laughs> has been Merge guys. Roundtable. It's been a lot of fun. Join us again next time. See you soon. Take care. Hey, is this is this level? I, I think the framing. It, oh, there we are. Hey, if you like that video, check out more. You got some over here, some over here, some over there. Check the description. Make sure you like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.